He has trouble getting up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, we got Okay. Please. Roll. Yes. Mark and Sarah. Representative Searboy. Here. Representative Crawford. Here. Representative Beal. Representative Jones. Here. Oh, Jones, sorry. Representative Keeney. Representative Riddle. Here. Representative Scharnhorst. Here. Representative Stream. Here. Count is six, six present, three absent. Well, um, we need to uh, one of the meetings we need to uh, listen to uh, Mr. Stronghorst and, and four sixty eight. Yeah. I get so many bill numbers I sometimes forget. Yeah, Dwight, I want to thank you for bringing this to our leadership uh, development policy committee this morning. And you know, this is a I don't know, fourth or fifth meeting we've had this year to discuss some of these big issues. You know, I know we've discussed tax credit reform, we've discussed the the, uh, the ISRIS debate, uh, let's see, we've discussed uh, some other energy issues, we've discussed tax credit reform, uh, you know, I think it's important for leadership to get together. Uh, we discussed budget, um, things like uh, tax amnesty, circuit breaker, all the things we're trying to do in the budget. So I think it's, right, Medicaid expansion, oh yeah, we've discussed Medicaid expansion before. Medicaid reform so. and uh, so I want to thank uh, everyone for getting up so early after a very, very late night. And um, Zach, do you have a, the analysis of the, the vote last night? So right, before you get into Bryce's yeah, law, yeah, I want to discuss sort of the, the, broader, the broader issue of education reform. So, uh, you know, on the broader issue of education reform, Bryce's Law, I, I think, is a key component of that because it's been, Bryce's Law has been discussed every single, I think every single year we've, almost, almost every single year we've been here. Right. Uh, and, oh, there's our chairman. Good to join us. Altercation of technology. Okay. <laughs> and you lost. So, I think the, uh, you know, the, the, we'll start with talking about the, um, the issue last night, which we knew was coming for a long time. We were preparing for the Educator Quality Bill for a long time. And, you know, the first comment I have to make is I, I have a hard time figuring out why there's not almost a super majority of people voting for this. Because you, when you look for the people who have voted for this issue, it's a cross-section of diversity of the cause of voting. the entire General Assembly. <laughs> so, for instance, uh, Representative Steve Webb voted for the bill last night. African American Democrat from from the uh, county of St. Louis. Uh, I know Penny Hubbard was was absent. I, she you know she had some health issues a few weeks ago, and I she couldn't stay late as we were going last night. But Penny Hubbard uh, is someone that would have been a yes on the bill. I, I know that for a fact. Uh, and you know inner inner city uh, black uh, African American female you know Democrat supporting the bill. Uh, Mike Colonna voted yes on the bill. I, I, was, I was actually a little surprised about that. I, was too. I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet. I did, I did not know he was going to support the bill. Sure, thank you. Uh, you look at um, some people in our caucus. Uh, we've got, uh, we had freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors supporting the bill. So uh, the yeses included members of all four classes. So there's a, there's a cross section of people across the board. Uh, we have, um, uh, Suburban people uh, like uh, myself, uh, Andrew Koenig, uh, Mike Searpoy, uh, Rick Stream, uh, Mike Lira. Mike Lira. You know, so you can go down the list. A lot of suburban people supporting the bill. Um, you have a lot of people who consider themselves uh, constitutional conservatives. You know, like like Andrew Koenig, like Kurt Barr, like uh, let me see here. Paul, Paul Kirkman, who was there. Okay, so you've got that group of people represented. Uh, you have rural Republicans uh, supporting the bill, uh, like our like our whip here, yeah. Sandy Crawford. And I, I will say you come from a, a long line of that because uh, Mike Parson, our former rules chair from Polk County, very close to your neck of the woods, he was a strong advocate for these issues. He was there, of course, every year from the very beginning. Uh, Todd Richardson, rural Southeast Missouri. Um, uh, let's see, Mike Bernsketter from right here in, in Cole County. Uh, Jay Barnes, can't forget Jay Barnes. He, uh, he's been a, a warrior for this issue. Uh, you have people in the, what I would say, came from the public um, education establishment. Uh, our chairman, Steve Cookson, former 
Superintendent. Superintendent. Yeah. Principal teacher. Former principal superintendent. Probably go the bus too. Principal <laughs> teacher. He said that once or twice. I'll bet he has. He did. He did. He supported this. Uh, the janitorial work. Jeannie Riddle. Conrad Jeannie. Jeannie Riddle, former yeah. educator. Step forward. Uh, rural uh, Republican uh, supporting the bill. So it's my point, I guess, is uh, uh, David Spe uh, Brian. Brian Spencer. Brian Spencer, um, educator. Former educator. He's taking a lot of pressure. <laughs> uh, former educator. Uh, hoping, hoping. I know he's hoping to be an educator again someday. This is a with term limits. This is a temporary position yeah. for him. Uh, but then you have you have you also have some strange votes. So you have uh, the one that I that caught my attention was Franklin County. Uh, Dave Henson uh, voted yes. His neighbor Dave Schatz voted no. Uh, Dave Henson has ties to. Uh, he, he's he's a fireman. He has First ties to. He, Dave Dave makes no bones about it. He he, he supports uh, some degree of public sector unions. You know he supports the firemen, the police, uh, the teachers. He supports the teachers, uh, but he voted yes. Dave Schatz, who's a small business small man, business. small oh, businessman, yeah. uh, and and someone who's a strong advocate. You know Dave Schatz wants us to push right to work this year. Yeah. And wants us to do right to work, but yet, the front of the line. but yet there's an issue there with pushing back against. I believe, and somebody could cap, tell me if I'm wrong. I believe the strongest proponents to this bill, and the opponents, are the teachers unions. That's one yes. of the biggest groups. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say so. And then the other biggest group is some of the other education establishment, the administrators, administrators, superintendents. superintendents. Maybe that some seems to be where the fear is is fostered is a lot of those people. The representative. Uh, fear is what we're dealing with. Right? Fear yeah. to take a take a vote that will help children rather than, than satisfy institutions and policy. You know the other the other analysis I, I saw. Right, the other analysis I want to show I want to point out is that um, it's interesting that some of the folks who are in seats that used to always oppose this and my example on that will be freshman uh, Sean Rhodes. Yeah. His predecessor right. was uh, Ward Franz. Ward Franz and I were very good friends, but I could never convince Ward to punch the yes button on any education reform bills, whether they were tax credit bills, open enrollment bills, <laughs> educator quality bills, Bryce's Law. Yep. Uh, Sean Rhodes is his successor, and right out of the gate, first year, Sean Rhodes is supporting the bill. So I've picked up people there, but I've lost some others. And uh, I guess my frustration is, you know, with this wide diversity of people who did support the bill, and the number was... Um, 55 yeses. I believe that number probably more accurately is, you know, if, if I were to really ask people and see where their true intentions were, I think about another 15 people would probably say, you know, if the bill is closer, I'll vote for it. So it's probably around 70, but that still is not enough for passage. Um, outside the building, um, the, the, the drive for education reform is even, I think, broader and more diverse than inside the building. For instance, uh, I, had a, I had a couple people who I really admire uh, follow me on Twitter last night. Uh, one of them is Katie Cassis, who is uh, from St. Louis City. Uh, I believe she uh, identifies herself more with the Democratic Party. Her husband, Martin, ran as a Democrat for state rep. I actually wish he was here right now uh, in our chamber, because I think he would have voted yes last night. And Katie has been a, uh, a warrior Stone for for education reform. Uh, she's very close with, I believe, Mayor Francis Slay, who I'm very close with as well, especially on these issues of charter schools and open, and, enrollment. and open enrollment and advancement of children over over education institutional bureaucrats and, right. and, 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 and public sector government unions. So on those issues, Francis has been, he stood up to his own party, yeah. and so has Kate. Um, other groups like, you know, Students First, which is a bipartisan group, nonpartisan, which spans the entire country. So. Uh, Governor Chris Christie supports issues like this. Bobby Jindal, uh, Rick Perry, um, Mitch, Daniel, uh, Mitch Daniels. Yeah. These are all these are all gentlemen leaders in our party. Some of whom intend to run for president next time. They will. So I I don't know why we don't have 82. You know, despite a lot of the Democrats who, and and folks who identify themselves more with the the uh, liberal side of the aisle, we have a lot of them. We have we have several of them obviously in the building supporting the bill. Many of many of the other groups outside the building support the bill on education reform. Yes, it is on the second page of our platform. But it's on the second page of our platform. We should have enough Republicans to carry this, and we should, and then we'd have some Why Democratic sure? members to carry. So, I'd like to hear anybody's ideas on on what. Where's the 
Where's the breakdown? Disconnect. Where's the disconnect with getting? Well, I need you too. I mean, with Bryce and Law, I need you like I've never needed you before. I mean, I'll be asking you this morning to go out among our members. And please, uh, where's the disconnect? Because Tim and I have been fighting this war for a while. Tim, Rick's been here, you know, as seniors, and Mark's been here. And Rick, I know you had some reservations early in your legislative career, but you came over uh, pretty early as you saw that something needed to be done. Did the same thing. Besides dumping billions of more dollars into the, into the system and thinking that's going to fix everything. So as someone who's been on the former school board, I want to allow you to sure. expand. expand. Yeah, I know when I came up here, I, I was a <coughs> school district supporter, uh, but also, you know, out of the gate, my first year, I did file a bill to form, reform the St. Louis Public Schools. And some of the things that we had in this bill, teacher evaluation, principal training, uh, alternative schools. Did you have Mary Kay in that too? No. It was a pretty simple bill. Uh, we, uh, the other thing I had was immerse the kids uh, in, and this was just dealing with the St. Louis Public Schools, which has just gone unaccredited, uh, immerse the kids uh, K through 3 in reading and math programs until they could get to grade level. But I ran into a major roadblock and buzzsaw with the unions down in the city. So, and I, I couldn't understand why they were opposed to doing simple things that we've done in the Kirkwood School District without any objection from teachers or administrators uh, to, to turn around uh, some of the programs in our district uh, with kids uh, who were failing. So these were simple reforms that would have, I think, worked well in the city of St. Louis school system. Once you know, the union got on board against it. Uh, it was dead. So I just, at that point, began to see. Well, you know, trying to work within the system sometimes doesn't work. And I slowly began to come around and realize, you know, we've got to do something to change. At least for the kids that are in these failing school districts. The Charter School Bill last year was a perfect example of that, where we we had to work so hard to get our rural Republicans to realize that the reforms that we were putting in place with the Charter Bill would not affect them at all. But there, there's just this massive fear out there fear. Of, of things that we're doing for school districts that are unaccredited or that are accredited that's going to you know, shift over to them. So I think you know, it's kind of an analysis that I had of what happened last time. I mean, we were get, all getting emails from uh, union teachers uh, that were form emails, the same email uh, verbatim, that was basically a lie about this bill about uh, tenure and everything else. And uh, Sandy, I want, Sandy and Jeannie, uh, you have some commonality. Uh, you're, 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 I guess you're considered more rural Republicans. You're both in leadership. Uh, supporting this issue has obviously not affected your career to the negative. In fact, Jeannie, you're the rules chairman. You're in the third highest position in the House. You're in your third term. I believe you will be the next state senator from mid-Missouri, without a doubt. So therefore, it hasn't hampered your career. It hasn't hampered your, your leadership abilities. You're a former educator. Uh, Sandy, you're now in leadership. There, there's several other rural people that did vote for the bill. I don't want to just hammer on the rural people. There's a lot of rural people who did vote, but it seems like there's a, we got about a third of them, and two-thirds of them are still not there. And I want to know where, what the problem is, Sandy. Sandy or Jeannie. I, well, I, I just want to make it make a comment. I just wonder how many of the teachers we're really hearing from because the ones that are negative to me in emails are the same ones over and over. But yet, earlier this session, I had several teachers from the new part of my district in my office face to face and it was a real eye opener for me because they said we're not opposed to teacher evaluations. If you keep some local control, we're okay with it. They told me that face to face. I think I just wonder how many more teachers there are out more there we know. that are not opposed to all this stuff, but just aren't talking. Mm -hmm. I just there's got to be more. I mean, because I had several of them tell me that face to face, Is that and I just thought that was that's pretty interesting. Because I travel around with Bryce's live, a lot of teachers come up to me after the event. And I hope you get your bill. And I just I saw Shelley leave. Show. I didn't realize she was in here. There's 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 a third one who's who's a rural Republican, who's, Shelley's been there on this yep. issue from the very beginning yeah. as well. Jeannie, as well. Why, Jeannie, why don't you go ahead? <clears throat> well, rural district, and I will tell you, the teachers that I taught with put their heart and soul into the classroom. They were there early, they were there late, they, they were there supplies. on the weekends, they put their money into yep. their own personal finances in, but they are also the same teachers that have told me that, and I see on a regular basis, still my very good friends, we care about teacher tenure. 
Good teachers are not concerned about tenure. Good teachers do their job because they love their students and they want them to succeed. Not just in Missouri, not just in the United States, but globally, because that's where we are. We're in a global society. So the tenure issue is, I don't understand that, so because the people that I taught with and that I'm still very good friends with, that are great teachers, that's not an issue. So there's number one. Number two, there have been a number of changes um, from the time that I taught. I was there 28 years, my husband put in 31. From the time that we started teaching until we retired, the scope of what you were allowed to do in the classroom. We have a curriculum. If you follow your curriculum curriculum guide, you make up your lesson plans, you go from there, your kids will succeed. You've got to do different things for different students based on where they are. And good teachers will do that. So the teachers that I associate with and I still see on a regular basis, they work their heart and soul out. And they believe that there needs to be some changes as well. So, so where's the disconnect with the people who are still voting no? Because it seems like a lot of times the faces have changed in these seats, but the votes are the same. Well, with, with term limits, you know, let's face it, we've got well, 100, okay. 130 new members in the last two elections. That's true. I always say that, and I sometimes forget. Two and a half, it, so 130 members have not been here more than two and a half years, two years and four months, whatever it is. So um, that, they're coming from their, their districts, and they're, a lot of them came up here with some or no, some or all support from school districts or teachers or something like that. I think uh, I think they're just they just don't realize what some of these bills do and how how important they are to to affecting the, the uh, students that are in the failing districts again. These, Statewide. Th this is it. I mean, when you and you mentioned it, Tim, and I've I've talked about it, and Dwight, you know this. Yeah. We we spend six hundred and seventy million dollars a year on prisons in Missouri, and fifty three percent of the inmates come from three school districts: St. Louis, Kansas City, and Wellston, which are not part of Normandy. Uh, I mean, that's a massive amount of money. It's a massive amount of failure, as far as I'm concerned, on those school districts. And if, if our members can't see that making some of these changes will turn these lives around forever. I mean, and you can do it. You have it isolated to where you can be surgical, go in and make changes in, in small areas that will affect this state and this country on a massive basis. We got yeah. it to where we could go. Yeah, Rick, I think you're right. And, you know, I'm looking at the just this very, I'm going to do a deeper analysis of this vote. And, uh, you know, I, I really did not, I, people knew I supported the bill, and I, I've spoken other times for these issues. Uh, I didn't speak on the floor of this particular bill, but I spoke about it in caucus to everyone. And people know where I am on, on this bill. And, uh, you know, it, I wanted to just get a, a pure, raw count last night and see where people are. Now, like I said, I think there's seven, eight more people that probably would vote for this. So we're probably in the, the mid-60s, you know, if you were to that's hold people under the gun. Yeah. But mid-60s is about right. Uh, I think that's about, because that's where we've always been. Yeah, uh, that's where we fall back to. From the very beginning. And when I, when I say where we've always been, on any of these issues under this umbrella. But in looking at the analysis, the no, the percentage of no's is definitely heavier amongst the newer folks. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, is this just an issue that is just so easy to demagogue and scare people at when the Missouri School Board Association, the Missouri superintendents, or the Missouri, you know, they come down and then they get an extra phone call from the superintendent back home, which is generally the most powerful person in the county and has been there longer and will be there longer than any state rep. Sheriff, presiding commissioner, and the superintendent. Yeah, oh, sheriff, presiding commissioner, and superintendent. And many of them And I agree. I think they demagogue it and they. They pontificate on platitudes and talking points. And when you sit there and you talk to Kevin Elmer, who I want to give a lot of credit to, Southwest Missouri guy, been under intense pressure. Asked for this. Brutally being attacked by his, his local educrats uh, in, in the paper, in editorials, by media down there. And he volunteered for this. I, I asked him yeah. if he knew what he was doing. And, and when you sit down and talk to him and he gives you the, the facts about the bill, it's hard to rebut what's actually in the bill. Yeah. So, Jeannie, well, you want to say something? I just, I went to, I went to high school in St. Louis. At, at that time, the largest high school in the state. But I had talked to you about wanting to get into some of the schools that were in trouble. I wanted to get into some of the charter schools just to. Yes, and on the, I don't know if you know this on our, uh, on our uh, speakers. No. <coughs> on the freshman tour, per your advice. Uh, one of the freshman tour stops was in the city of St. Louis, Mayor Francis Slay. I wasn't there that day, but I had another meeting, but I, I, I reached out and asked him if he would help 
and Mayor Francis Slay uh, hosted uh, our freshman group, Democrats and Republicans, everyone on the, who was on the tour at that time, to a charter school in the city. It had previously been a public school where he had gone to school, I believe. Wow. It had failed and closed, and they reopened it as a charter school. So yeah, I took your advice on that. Well, I think sometimes, because you live in your area and you're familiar with the teachers and the, the administration and the students, that we need to take some of our body into these schools that are failing, and they need to walk the halls and see the faces of those kids. And the, the hope or lack of hope of what are we going to do to make sure that they are not those numbers that end up in our prison system. Tim, that's, our, that's our job, our charge. I think it's something we need to mention is, I think our philosophy, we haven't used the word yet, and it's feared by that inst those institutions is competition. And until competition is introduced into education to where you've got somebody that if you don't do it, they will do it better. I'm not, I don't think we're going to make a lot of progress in education. Dwight, and I'm sorry, I know we got off on that tangent, but in light of what just happened a few hours ago, I thought we should discuss it. Could you could you tell everybody, I think everybody should know what Bryce's Law is, but could you just tell us what the version of the bill right. this, year this year does right. and, and what you hope to accomplish? Well, this year's version is, there's <coughs> major alterations to the, to the bill uh, due to testimony in, at different times in committee. But as you know, it's a tax credit scholarship bill. And that, the, the, the fear word for that is voucher. Uh, I'm not afraid of the word voucher in this situation. Uh, we've been ignoring these children for quite a while, and I mean, we guarantee by Constitution a free public education. These children, by and large, are not receiving it. Uh, our caucus fell on the sword three years ago and, and voted a mandate to insurance companies to cover these children on their parents' insurance policies through their employer. We did our part to help these kids. The bill this year calls on the, op the other side to fall on the sword against their unions and do the right thing for the kids once again. The situation we have is uh, I've taken the ceiling on the, the claim for tax credit from 800000 down to 250000 The 50% is locked in as far as how, how much of their tax liability they can put against the tax credit program. We've also gone from school age at five years old all the way down to birth. As long as a child has a diagnosis of autism by a physician, they will qualify. They can either do it through first steps, if they're rejected by first steps, there's a, there's a process to include them as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't a massive bill that's going to alter the terrain of education. What it's going to do is guarantee a uh, quality of life improvement for children that by and large cannot speak their parents are somewhat victims to them. I mean, the life that we're talking about changes dra drastically when an autism uh, diagnosis is given. There has to be someone with these children constantly. They don't go to the movies. They don't go on family vacations like the rest of us. They're locked into a world to where everything has to be focused on the safety of the siblings, that child, and the family. Sandy Hook, unfortunately, I have to bring that up, is a product of what we're not doing. We are not providing what is na internationally recognized as the regimen that will alter these children's lives, ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis. It's an expensive process that the education uh, world can't afford. I'm not asking them to do that. I'm trying to free up the children that are slowing down these classrooms. A lot of us have that ability. Uh, the special school district in St. Louis is tremendous. They're doing a, a fabulous job. We need a special school district for the state of Missouri. We need to include, we're seeing diagnosis now, the latest one I've heard is one in 44 is on the spectrum somewhere. What early this bill will do. Huh? Early intervention. It is. It's all about early intervention. That's why we ratchet it down to, to, to the child that's born, gets a diagnosis probably around 18 months, and it's ready for treatment right then. And Dwight, isn't the intent behind your bill is, you know, we're lucky in St. Louis, you're right. We, we are. Our parents, the parents who can afford it, yeah. parents who can afford yeah. it, Senator Schmidt can, can afford it to have, Stephen. Right. They have the choice to use some of these great institutions we have. But when you get outside that area, yeah. in the rural areas, isn't the 10-year bill to help the small number of parents that have children with these incredible special needs? Right. Because the current public education system they are in, they can't handle it. They're not giving that 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 public appropriate free public education. Right. So this just gives them a choice to yes. get that child to a place where they need to be. And what's the fiscal note on your bill this year? $52,000 is the state fiscal note. And how much out of foundation? 
Uh, well, you know, how much out of the foundation for them? I have no idea on that. I, I, I'm not going to not concern myself with that so much as the foundation for what, what I'm trying to do, and this will cause great inconvenience to these, these outstate parents. They're going to have to go to places where they can get this. So it's not like anybody's getting this, oh boy, I want some too. You're going to have to go to a lot of trouble to avail yourself of these services. But like I say, with the diagnosis we're seeing, with the direction we're going, we're looking, we're looking at more and more of, of Sandy Hook and things like that. You know, I, I, I don't understand how people can look at this and not, if you can't see it on a humanitarian level, see it on an economic level. Especially my people on my side of the aisle, my conservatives. These people, these children are going to cost over a lifetime three to four million dollars in government services of one kind or another, lost production by parents. If one parent turns in to the, to the, the caregiver, and ladies and gentlemen, you know with inflation, the way it's traveling, in 10 years, that three to four million will probably be six to eight. Do we, if you can't see it on the fact of it's the right thing to do for children, look at it as what this state's going to have to spend and what it's, the impact it's going to have on other programs to take care of these children. So I, I implore my mem other members here on the leadership, please go to your, to your fellow legislators and impress upon them, it's your turn. Somebody's calling, there's a knock at the door, answer the door. Don't kick the can further down the road. Dwight, you mentioned the insurance mandate, and yeah. it's interesting. I, I hope that because we stood up against the insurance uh, institution right. and passed that bill, you would think we could stand up against the Teacher uh, public sector teachers union and pass this bill. And and I would hope we could find $52,000 <coughs> for autistic kids in a $25 billion budget. I'm sure there's a rock somewhere we could turn over the debt to be too fast. So Senator Schaefer will find it. Um, for, you know, uh, one point, too, on this whole thing. A couple of years ago, Dwight, uh, when your bill was up, I actually went to teachers um, in my district, Rockwood, Parkway, and Kirkwood, and uh, on, off the record, just asked them what they felt about this bill. I explained it, what it would do to basically give uh, special help to the autistic kids take them out of the classrooms that they were in. It's almost so severely autistic. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, what, that's and, and, and the problem was, it's, even in St. Louis County, we have uh, many, many of our parents who can't afford these other programs. Right. So they have their kids in the public schools or through, in the special school district, which is a great, great uh, school district, but it still cannot provide the, the specialized treatment in many cases for these autistic kids. You I asked these one. teachers if, if they would approve of this bill, if they liked it, and every single one of them said yes for a variety of reasons. Two of them were that it would, they knew it would help the kids. And number two, they said it would take the kids out of their classroom where they were very disruptive. Oh, yeah. They slow everything down. That's right. So, Bryce, uh, did. when you talk to the teachers individually off the record about yeah. this bill, they all like it. They do. They do. But it, and, and you know what's interesting? You mentioned, the, you mentioned vouchers, and I just want to point out, I think it was uh, last week, State of Indiana's uh, Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the new voucher bill that was passed. So I, I, I think it's overall embarrassing how far behind uh, we're falling. This conservative majority is on this one issue. When you look across the country, and it's as I said, it's bipartisan. There's a group of uh, I, there was another news story today. The group of parents in Los Angeles, California, they're a self-described uh, liberal progressive group, group of parents that demanded the parent trigger option. A bill that I have filed this year and here that's to, huge in my to give more parents a choice. Uh, they're battling in court still, and they're exercising that right to use that parent trigger. You look on the other coast. I believe Massachusetts has oh, one of the you bring it up. Massachusetts has one of the most wide open available school choice programs in the country. Over a hundred years with vouchers. And you know what? That's the home of Harvard and uh, yeah. and uh, MIT. Yep. So maybe they're just smarter up there. I don't know, but they they've got education reform figured out. Go, go down, go down to the conservative strongholds of uh, of Louisiana, uh, Florida. Uh, look at uh, what they're doing in um, in uh, I mentioned Indiana, Texas. Uh, you know, it's it's bipartisan, it's multipartisan, it's nonpartisan, whatever you want to call it. We seem to be on controlled by our and demagogued by fear. our by fear by fear by institutional groups and special interests. If, with what we did with the insurance on, for these children, if we could do Bryce's law, I think it propels Missouri into the lead in the country as far as addressing the education of these children. No other state, I think, has all of that <coughs> package. And I want Missouri to stand up for these kids 
Because like I said, most of them are non-vocal. How in the world can you stand in this institution and advocate against children that can't speak? Mark, um, well, the status quo was comfortable. But the status quo doesn't solve the issue. And you know, like, uh, like Rick I would want to make what? one other thing. I want to make sure I, I get in here, Mark. I apologize for interrupting. Rex Sinkle <coughs> has nothing to do with this bill. He has been gone for so long. I've been alone. These people are the people that are helping me, not Rex. So let's get that into the media, ladies and gentlemen. Let's stop demagoguing this bill that it's a remnant of Rex Sinkle. Thank God that Rex tried. And I can tell you now, I'm, I'm researching right now going to a grant approach. And that's the kind of thing that I, I might have to do that where I have to go hat in hand begging in public instead of us standing up and doing what this government should do. What would that be? What, would that be? what do you mean by a grant approach? Well, we, they would be able, we would be able to establish the program and apply for federal, state, and private grants. Oh, okay. And that we're, uh, I've got research going on right now, legislative research, to see if we can do that. That's why I'm, I've asked John to hold the bill for a few days to see where we can go. He's been kind enough to work with me in every way. I push, push, push. Hey, John, get the bill out. Get the bill out. Then I come to him the day he wants to bring out. I go, don't bring the bill out. <laughs> yeah, and Dwight, you're right. You're right about that. You know, the, the two people I've always, uh, who taught me about this issue uh, before I even first got here were, uh, were Jane Cunningham. Mm -hmm. uh, she had and, a bill before me. And Senator Ed Emery. Yep. And you couldn't get... I mean, they're both conservatives, but you couldn't get more two different people from different parts Diversity. of the state. Yeah. You know, Jane came from the suburban St. Louis. She was on a school Plus board in Washington. Husband, yeah, uh, and Ed Ed came from very very rural. In Lamar. fact, his Senate district, I believe, now includes the Jones family farm. So, uh, <laughs> the son of the soil. Uh, so and so Ed Ed was somebody who I learned at his knee on this issue, and Ed predated any of the special interests on our side of the issue, any of the lobbyists who lobby for education reform, any of the groups, any of the, the financiers. I mean, Ed, because Ed is a, Ed is a pure thinker. Uh, he's one of the purest. And when he doesn't he, read anything into the Constitution, no. he reads the Constitution. And, and when, when he advocated for this issue with me as a freshman, he was a junior, maybe, uh, I just believed it was the right thing to do. And I'm glad he's now over in the Senate. Me too. Because hopefully there's maybe some help I'm trying to get it to uh, over there, yeah. because and those those are the kind of people that, that I, I look to, and and again, you know, Ed Ed comes from one of the most rural Senate districts in the state. It's interesting that somebody like him has the position he has, but some of uh, his reps, <coughs> some, some some supported the bill last night, some did not. I just find it, I just find the conflict between the it's confusing. It's it? very confusing. It's it a patchwork. Is. It's like and flying in an airplane in the clouds in and, fog. And, and, and we'll wrap up. I know we're way over on this, but it's an, issue, it's an issue near and dear to both of us, I know. I know you. you're not getting it until next year anyway. <laughs> Don't say that. Yeah, the last, uh, what was my last uh, point? Oh, uh, Kathy Swan's bill. You know, Kathy Swan's bill started off with the same exact whip count, 55, which is amazing. And we said, okay, and I thought that bill was a lot less dramatic than this one. Like, good grief, all we want to do is put a grading system like we do for our children. We're trying to help St. Louis City Schools. Uh, so so, uh, so we, we got the whip count, it was 55, it's ironic, and we said, okay, this bill we believe is being demagogued, it's being misrepresented. And what we found out when we brought people into this room, we worked on it for five or six hours in this room, brought in groups of people, 10, 12 at a time, and, and the undecideds and the no's, mainly a lot of undecideds. Exactly and said, okay, what do you think's in the bill? He said, okay, we're gonna tell you what's in the bill. And, and then there was, a, there was a compromise between some of the folks who, on the other side of the issue, wanted to tweak the bill, and we, we permitted that. And then we got, we got those people together, sort of the leadership of yes and no's, and right. they, they became yeses with the amendment. You built it. And then we built, and it took a long time, over two days, and maybe that's what we need to. I didn't know we had I to do that on every single bill. I think bill, that's exactly what they're called for. Possibly what we're going to have to do. I because when you because when you explain what's actually in the bill right. and what it does, what it does it doesn't do, and they understand it, it seems that it moves forward. You want to give them a place to stand that they can turn around and say to the people that have been pressuring them, "This is why I've moved to this." And, and Kathy Swan's bill ended up with 129 votes on the yeah. House floor. Was assisted with a friendly amendment by Brandon Ellington. Yeah. 
uh, and had overwhelming bipartisan support from all parts of the state and both sides of the aisle. And I would consider that bill very much in the vein of the topic of this bill. It does different things. This bill is bigger. Right. It's got about 631. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's bigger. Uh, but that's that's. Right. I agree. I think you're exactly right. And I, that is going to be the approach we have to take. We're going to have to do due diligence on these to, to let people talk to us and then give them what it is that we see from the fact that we've been here a little while and we've been working on these issues and we understand a little more about it not making us superior in any way, but we have to educate. Thanks for the extra time. Thank you for the, for any attention you've Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to make some suggestions for you. Know, since this is a, a, leader, a leadership group where, you know, we have it because we're the ones governed with setting the agenda and deciding what to do and show up to lead. struggling, <laughs> show up to lead, uh, struggling with these big issues. I'm going to suggest some future topics would be, if we can find him, Jay Barnes, he's busy, you know, hard to track down. Busy. I'd like to find out where we are. I really haven't studied uh, the current HB 700 in depth. I've only, you know, kind of looked at it broadly. Uh, the tax credit reform debate is going to be moving forward, I know, soon, because uh, Ann Zara, I know, has a House bill that she's moved out, I think is in rules, Jeannie, is that right? Is 698. Yeah. Uh, you should have it, it's out of committee. I think this DOR issue uh, needs to continue to have our attention. We moved a bill yesterday on that, and, uh, you know, we do need to balance some, some concerns there. You know, the federal government is, the, the, the balancing test there is, you know, I think our DOR just, I think they got, they, now, the cover-up and the explanation sometimes if they're not correct are worse than what you did on the front end. And, you know, there's an issue there of the federal government, you know, per threatening to uh, take away Missourians' ability to travel by saying our driver's license may not be valid. That's kind of what's going on here. DOR is trying to argue we're fine, and in the meantime, uh, they're being caught doing all kinds of things that are potentially in contravention of law. So I think if they just come clean, we can all work on this together, but we need to discuss that issue. Another issue that you all probably came that saw came up is uh, uh, I've uh, I've challenged the uh, governor, former attorney general, on an issue that I thought he would be supportive of, both in the sunshine aspect and in protecting children, and that's this issue of closing these records of cases of, of children who of the abuse and the neglect and some of these deaths that have occurred in our state's uh, public welfare system. And so I'm really shocked that the former attorney general, current governor, is looking to close records. Uh, and looking to potentially obscure what's potentially happened and, you know, allegedly some uh, very serious uh, issues. And so, you know, as a former prosecutor myself and, and someone who's been a strong child advocate, um, both on education and these issues, I think that might be something we have to look at and deciding if we need to take some action on that. Because that's a new issue that's just popped up. We steal his chairmanship. That's right. So, Mr. Chairman, if you want to wrap us up, I know we got to, we're, we're 20 minutes late on leadership here, so. Did oh, you want to say something? <laughs> no, uh, I'm good. We need your help. We're adjourned. We're adjourned. <laughs> that was easy. Oh, oh and I was just reminded that we're, we're holding up a visit by Senator Bond, too. Former oh. Senator Kip Bond. So. Son of Missouri. Blame it on me. Usually <laughs> yes. do. All right. Thank you, Mark, very much. Thanks for getting us all together again. Thank you all for coming in. I do appreciate it.